Hi, I'm Stu Brody, the founder of the Center for Chronobiology here at UCSD and currently the co-director of the center. I'm going to tell you a little bit, as best I remember and know, the history of chronobiology here at UCSD. It goes back uh, more than 50 years. The very first papers on the chronobiology of single-cell organisms were done here at Scripps Institute of Oceanography prior to UCSD actually coming into existence. They were done on a single-celled organism called Goniolex polyhedra. And they were done by Beatrice Sweeney, who was a, a research associate, and uh, Woody Hastings, who came from the University of Illinois on sabbatical or summers to do these things together. The very first paper was published by Sweeney and Sweeney and Hastings in 1957. They were the first ones to describe uh, a rhythm in a free-living single-cell organism. This is the Goniolex, which is a dinoflagellate that lives in the ocean that many people have seen in the summer as a type, a colorful type. They published the first phase response curve for single cells to light, and they published the first uh, illustration that uh, single cell organisms have rhythms that are temperature compensated. And actually the reason they were studying this at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography is because the Navy had instituted studies in the early 40s on this organism because it was found in the South Pacific. And as the ships of the U.S. Navy went, even on dark nights, through the water in the South Pacific, the stimulus of the water, the weight of the ship, would make these organisms glow. And so they would essentially be targets, because you could see the weight of the ships, even though the lights were out and the moon wasn't on. So the Navy started wanting to see what was involved with this organism, and that's why Scripps Oceanography started. Anyhow, the first slide shows the photosynthetic rhythm in single cells of Goniolex. It was in a Cold Spring Harbor Symposium in 1960, so that's 50 years ago. And there, that's the first interesting thing. The second interesting thing is that the uh, address for Beecher Sweeney is the University of California in La Jolla. Now, that had a very short half-life, UCLJ, uh, maybe a year or two, surely before I came in 67. Uh, people figured out after a while that since it was the city of San Diego that gave the land to UCSD, it should be called UCSD and not UCLJ. There are not many people who remember UCLJ. <coughs> Anyhow, uh, Sometime in the early 60s, Beatrice left BZ, we called her, and went to Yale to take a position there. And nothing much was done on, on circadian rhythms uh, at UCSD until I came along. And one of my friends convinced me to work on the circadian rhythm of the Rosberg. This is sometimes in the early 70s. So he gave me the strain that he needed, and we worked on it. I had a young lady come in one time to ask if she could work on circadian rhythms. I said, well, I was just starting to get interested in it. So she and I started to work on it. Her name is Stephanie Harris. She went to medical school eventually. And we published, as you see on the next slide, a paper that was my first paper on circadian rhythms. It was in 1973, and it was in Science. And it was Circadian Rhythms in Neurospro, it was at about pyridine nucleotide levels, NAD and NADH. And that was my, that was my first, and that was the first uh, one exhibiting that you could, in fact, measure um, various things on a petri dish. And there was a picture of a neurosper growing on top of auger. So that was in 1973. So I continued with those uh, types of studies. And then in 1975, I published a paper in the Journal of Bacteriology measuring the levels of ATP and ADP, and the title of that paper was Oscillations in the Level of an Adenine Nucleotide. These papers were quoted and, but, uh, for a few years, but now hardly anybody seems to remember them, and they're all now rediscovering that this is something useful and interesting to work on. <coughs> 
Anyhow, uh, that work continued in my lab. In 1976, uh, uh, one of my colleagues and myself got some money to the NSF to sponsor meetings here in La Jolla, like $5,000 meetings. So I sponsored one in January of 1976 called the La Jolla Conference on Circadian Rhythms. And it was just over a long weekend. It started on a Thursday night, ended on a Sunday morning. And it was seven sessions on photoreceptors and models and genetics. And we had all the leaders of the field come. We paid for them to come and stay and was at the Torrey Pines Inn uh, to come and talk and present these things. It was a very intense meeting, very important and interesting meeting in the field because it brought together for the first time, I think, the people who study plant clocks, who study animal clocks, who study single cells, who study mechanisms, who were interested in the genetics and modeling, etc. And I think it's fair to say that that meeting led eventually to a few years later having a Gordon conference in chronobiology and also to a workshop that was convened at the Marine Station, the Hopkins Marine Station of Stanford up Pacific Road. And I'll talk about that in a minute. At that time, because I, I have here the, uh, the actual program and the list of people who came, at that time the people at UCSD who were working on clocks, they were besides myself, Jeff Elliott was here, Bob Moore who did a lot of wonderful work on the SCN being the, the clock, or a good part of the clock in animals. Dan Kripke had come and was starting studies on sleep rhythms. Jim Enright at SIO was studying tidal rhythms. And Warren Butler, who was a photobiologist, who was studying the photobiology of uh, the photoreception of clocks. Uh, sometime after that meeting, uh, we had another prominent Chronobiologists come to our campus, Soya and Kobe Israel, who started for 30 years of studying um, sleep and rhythms, uh, which he's uh, world famous for now. Sometime in the 80s, then Chris Gillen came from NIH and studied sleep and rhythms, and Barbara Perry came also from NIH eventually to study uh, rhythms in women and the the effects of menopause and postmenstrual variety of things. Anyhow, I had the idea once we had gotten what uh, Bob Moore left that we should have another meeting. And so I proposed, I sent around a letter to my friends proposing that we have an annual conference series on rhythms in biology and medicine. And this was sometime in the early 80s. Well, we never quite got around to it. Though I see we've sort of gotten, gotten to it now. <clears throat> I also proposed, I see here a, a note, a draft in 1991 to have a center, an international center devoted to research, education, and service in biological rhythms. Well, we finally got one 20 years later. <clears throat> the one of the things that I thought was interesting, it's a little bit of a sidetrack is the Hopkins Marine Station had in 1977 a workshop in biological clocks and I participated in it and I got this certificate from the biological from the workshop and it said that I had attended all the lectures in laboratories and therefore I had gotten a degree of rhythms summa cum tempo which I thought was really cool anyhow they had that workshop for a couple of years and then uh, Colin Pittenshaw moved on <coughs> In the meantime, the University of Virginia was setting up its uh, Center for Biological Timings, uh, which really was very useful in the field. What we were doing then is in the early 80s, a group of people in physics and engineering uh, set up an organized research unit called Nonlinear Science. And this was in 1984. It was called the Project in Nonlinear Science. The campus sent out a notice from the vice chancellor <clears throat> saying that they would like to have people come to be in residence for three months or six months to interact with the resident group. So I 
sponsored the letter to Harold Tico, the vice chancellor, and sponsored Art Winfrey, who at that time was at Purdue. I think he had just won a MacArthur Award, but anyhow, he was well known in the clock field and well known to everyone studying linear science, nonlinear science. So Art came out, and he interacted with all of us, and I arranged for him in the winter of 1985 to give a series of six lectures that were on sleep rhythms and biological clocks and uh, cardiac rhythms and excitable media, anyhow. It was a, a very a useful and important set of lectures over a six week period or a quarter that had 100 people come. I took note of who they were. They were from something like 10 or 15 different departments. It was amazing to see my colleagues from not only psychology and psychiatry, but from, uh, music, etc. I think the next uh, major thing that, that I would mention was in 1998, Michael Gorman came here after he finished his postdoctoral to be in the Department of Psychology. <clears throat> and I uh, interacted with him some uh, at meetings and on campus, but then about in 2005, <clears throat> we <clears throat> co-founded a course in chronobiology, <clears throat> which was an undergraduate course Sorry, the fall of 2004, so that means we started the year before. <coughs> and that course has been going every fall or winter since then. <coughs> we have now, the first year we taught it, we only had 50 students. <coughs> and the people explain, the students explain to me that <coughs> that's because we taught it at 8 o'clock in the morning. And that if anyone should know that undergraduates were not going to come, at 8 o'clock in the morning. It's the chronobiologist. We eventually had the registrar switch the course to later in the day, and we got 100 and then 150. And now that I'm retiring, Susan Golden will take my half of the course. And I think the, the uh, registrar has told us that the registration is up to 250 with 100 on the waiting list. So this is surely the largest clock course anywhere or ever. Sometime in the 90s, David Welsh came after his residency in psychiatry, came to Steve K. Lab when Steve was over at the Scripps uh, Research Institute, and David started a journal club called Clock Watchers, which was patterned after the one he had uh, been involved with at Harvard and Brandeis, MIT. And that met over there and now meets on our campus. I think we've had 80 of them over. Uh, eight years. And then, of course, more recently, Steve Kay and his whole group ecosystem came from Scripps, and Steve is now the dean. And then Susan Golden and her group came shortly after. Uh, within the last couple of years, David Welsh now has his own lab in the psychiatry department in the medical school. So once all of these people had come, I got the idea to resuscitate our clock center. And so I proposed to the campus that we have an organized research unit in chronobiology to be called the Center for Chronobiology. And I got a lot of help in writing this up from David Welsh and primarily Michael Gordon. And this was approved and now we have a, a, a center without walls with 25 members scattered over eight different departments uh, on campus, including the SALT. And we've had some very successful chronobiology affairs, both uh, internal workshops and then this past March, a big symposium where we invited 14 people from around the country called From Cells to Clinic. So that was our symposium this past March. So that is in brief this history of chronobiology at UCSD, starting with the Navy funding work on chronobiology because they were in military use to now being not just military use anymore, but a great interest in terms of medicine and basic research, etc. And I was glad to be a part of most of that. And of course, I may have left out a few of the details and a few of the people, but at least that's the best that I remember all of it. All right.